Well, hello, good morning once again. Welcome to Whispering Hope, Daily Sabbath School Lesson Review. And here with me this morning, I have Elder Ellis. Elder Ellis, how is it? How is it? I see you're going solo this morning. Guess Dr. Ellis is otherwise engaged. He's still happy to have you this morning on to go through this very intriguing and interesting lesson to me. Paul is building a crescendo here, and I think this whole book of Ephesians is going to explode into something good. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine, Elder Joseph. It's so good to see you with your new look. <laughs> oh, yes, remember I told you I'm trying to turn back the hands of time and looking as youthful as you do. Well, well, <laughs> that's an ambitious move. <laughs> very ambitious it's so good to see you it's so good thank god for this morning i must give thanks amen amen this week we are studying the lesson horizontal atonement the cross and the church what's that for a topic but we're gonna find out more as we go into our lesson this morning before we go into our specific topic for today, I'm going to invite Elder Ellis to read for us our memory text after I would have invited God's presence into our midst this morning. Eternal God and our Father, we just want to thank you for life. We want to thank you for the privilege of the gift of your Son, that while we were yet in trespasses and sin, Christ died for us. And so as we go into your words this morning to learn more about your son your plan for us we pray that your holy spirit will be here to bring enlightenment to us in jesus name amen 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 our memory text is taken from ephesians chapter 2 reading verses 13 and 14 but now in christ jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. Ellis, as you look at that text, that passage of scripture that we have as our key text for this week's study, what popped out to you as you read it there this morning? Now, as I read these two verses of scripture, it says, but now. You know, it tells me that something came before that. This but is a conjunction, which means that Paul would have expressed uh, the condition of the Ephesians at the time. And, and so now he is bringing a new perspective. He says, but now you... But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And Paul is speaking here to the Gentiles. That they were far off, but now they are brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And what jump out is that I see something personal. Something for myself that once I was far off, but Christ's sacrifice on the cross did something for me. Christ has brought me near so that salvation is within my reach. I'm exposed to salvation. It is that hand reach that all I have to do is to reach out. And the text goes on to say, for he himself is our peace, which means that there was some sort of war. We had a war within, we had a war with my fellow men, we had a war in the church. Christ is our peace who has made us both one. So now there is no separation, there is oneness, there is unity. And that speaks volume to me. Ellis, I heard you using a word there, uh, Gentiles. You know, for our, our viewers, those who are studying with us every morning, 
and they want to put it in our perspective how to make that text real in our modern day in our contemporary society how would you do an explanation to and uh, for them to understand what the terminology gentiles mean looking back then there seemed to have been this rift between jews and gentiles the jews as it were were those who have been chosen by god so that they can carry out god's standard they could be as it were the light bearers they can point others to christ and the gentiles were those who as it were were the separated ones they were heathens they were not within as it were the commonwealth of israel the jews belonged to israel the gentiles they were others and if i were to put it in today's language even though it may not the analogy may not properly fit however there are some within the church who were born in the church they will you know pat themselves in the shoulder and say, I was born in this church, or I'm a second generation, I'm a third generation Seventh-day Adventist. I am an Ovarian. I came from, as it were, other churches. My parents were Methodists and so on. So I am, as it were, adopted into the church. And from time to time you would hear these remarks and sometimes maybe you envy these folks who were brought up they never eat pork they never eat this they never eat that (laughs) and so you feel as though they have an advantage on those who came in however what we are seeing in the memory text that Christ has broken down that division. So there is no longer any Jews or Gentiles. We are all Christians once we accept Jesus Christ. And we all have the same rights. And I'm happy for that. Well, Elder, you you used a very good analogy. So we are Jews and Gentiles on the platform this morning because I would boast that I am a third generation Seventh Day Adventist, and then he, 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 so. But what what turns on that anyway? And so I get the picture as you painted it a while ago that you're saying there's no separation, there's no Jew nor Gentile, there's no first generation or second generation Adventist or Adventist who came in from Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Moravians. Uh, whatever the religion is that our church of god of prophecy doesn't matter what religion you're coming from once you come and you're one in god observing the truth there should be no discrimination some people are separated by race whether black or white or yellow or brown whatever race or where you come from and then in the Caribbean, you know, my Lou here, we may say, you're from Guyana, I'm from Antigua, you're from Jamaica, I'm from Barbados, that sort of stuff. But when we come together as God's people. So in that situation, Elder, now I kind of understand the context of the topic this week. It says, Jesus, preacher of peace. It seems to be suggesting that there were probably chaos or war strife in the church because paul was writing to the church what say you elder of course there were because paul would not have written how he wrote had there been a need for some form of admonition in the church there there was name calling the gentiles were called the uncircumcised and sometimes when we read the, the bible we would have read about the uncircumcised Philistines and the uncircumcised this. So even though these were believers who had come into the church, yet at that point there was no need for circumcision because Christ would have already broken down the wall. And still there was this division there was this prejudice there was this 
situation where people felt that they had more lease. And the funny thing about it is that it was not only among the common people because we read, I think, somewhere in the book of Acts, Peter was eating with the people, with the Gentiles and so on. And when it was James and the others, when they came down, Peter separated himself, refused to eat with the Gentiles. So this thing was even among the big shots that you did not want to be associated with certain people. And so, like I said, there was name calling the Gentiles or those who would have been converted from the Gentiles. They would have been calling the, the, the Jews the circumcision. And the, the, the other folks would call them the uncircumcised and so on. So they had need for peace. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Ephesians 2, verses 17 and 18. It says, And he came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. How does Paul summarize the ministry of Christ in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17? Those two verses. Paul spoke that Jesus came and he preached peace to those who are far. But also he said to those who are near too. Because both Jews and Gentiles, they, they, they were now believers, whether they consider them, themselves those who are not of the commonwealth of Israel and now they are as it were, adopted, they uh, have gained citizenship, if one wants to use a term from countries that would have the immigration system and so on. Now these people have been accepted. Jesus preached the same message to both. The message of peace, both to those who were far and those who were near. That is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And we all need the same message when it comes to accepting Jesus Christ. The writer of the Quarterly says that the concept of peace is important in Ephesians with the letter beginning and ending with blessings of peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. So the message of peace is very important. God's church is a church of unity. God's people should have peace. Peace in our homes, peace in our hearts, peace in the church. If there are conflicts in the church and the preaching cannot bring about peace, then there's something wrong. Because we are told that blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus is the Prince of Peace according to, to Isaiah. And Jesus' way is the best way. There is no other way. There is no better way than Jesus' way. And so Paul summarizes that that is what, if there is this unity, if there is a problem in the church, what we need is the message of peace, peace and love. Because if we are going to meet conflict with conflict, it will just escalate. But love always triumphs over war and hate. Elder, I picked up on this particular verse that you just read. For it said, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. 
it seems like it doesn't matter whether I'm from originally from Jamaica or originally from Guyana or Trinidad or Barbados. Wherever I reside now, and we all share the same national document, which is the passport. There's no half citizen. We are all citizens. It doesn't matter how what I became a citizen by descendant, by birth, or by naturalization. We're all sharing equal. Is that what Paul is saying, Elder Ellis? No, so sometimes we can use analogies, perhaps physical analogies and so on, but they always seem to fall short when it comes to spiritual matters. Because I may be a citizen of the United States. I was adopted, as it were, and having gone through the laws and so on, I became a citizen. However, there are certain rights of, of citizenship that because I was not born there, I will not have. I cannot be the president of the United States because I wasn't born there. However, however, with Christ, and that is what the text is bringing out to us, with Christ, we all have the same rights. There is nothing I can boast about. There is nothing no one in the church can boast about. And when we look at last week's study, Ephesians chapter 1, perhaps verse, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10, we would have seen that there is nothing that we can boast about. We are all saved by grace through faith, and it's not of ourselves, but it's a gift, it's the gift of God. And here Paul is bringing it out again that through the blood of Christ, we are made one. And so it doesn't matter what. We have nothing to boast about. I can say that I was privileged to live in many countries. And in living in many countries, whether you are in the church or you're out of the church, there are certain, you know, semblances of discrimination that you find not being born there. I remember being in the United States in a church. I was sitting on the lay activities, what you call the personal ministries council. And there are certain suggestions that I make as a Caribbean person that the Americans don't buy. And after meetings, the Trinidadians who were there, the Jamaicans who were there, they would pull aside and we would get in our own little constancy. Brother, what you are saying, it can work. We have done it in Jamaica. We have done it in Trinidad. The Americans will not buy it. You don't have the same accent and so on. And so these are the things that the church was faced with. But in Christ, the wall, the partition has been broken down because we have nothing to merit salvation. Jesus has done that for us. And therefore, therefore, for those who probably may have a chip on their shoulder, this lesson is telling us that in Christ, we are one. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. So it doesn't matter what position I hold in the church, what seat I probably might have contributed to the church, I should be able to sit anywhere in God's place because it's God's house. Hello, so we're going to go through another series of texts. You'll take the first Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. I'll take Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. And you'll return with Romans 10, 14, and 15, and we'll continue in that vein until we have exhausted them. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
Okay, and Ephesians 6, 14 and 15 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. It says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And Ephesians chapter 2 verses 17 to 19 says, And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Isaiah chapter 52 verse, verse 7. It says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. And Isaiah 57, 19 says, I create the fruit of the lip, peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, said the Lord, and I will heal him. Now the question is, Elder Ellis, how does Paul imagine believers participating in sharing Jesus' message of peace? Now I like how Paul puts it in one of the texts that we read there. He used the word diligent. Paul expects that believers who have accepted Jesus Christ would be diligent about preaching the word of God. One should be exuberant about it. We were rescued. I mean, one cannot help going back to how Paul laid this foundation in the beginning of e Ephesians chapter 2. He said we were dead in sins and trespasses. We were, as it were, alienated. Well, not only dead, but we were resurrected. And now, this week, he has started to say we were afar, and Christ has bridged the gap to his blood so that we are now near. We are, as it were, ready to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, accepting Jesus, we are kingdom people. They are others who are yet to know this. We should use our experience, what God has brought us from. He, Paul is not saying we are this. He said we were in such a situation and we know what Christ has done for us. And Christ has now come and he has preached the message of peace. We can have peace in our hearts, peace in our minds. Christ has empowered us through his spirit and he spoke about his spirit there so that we could have peace. We could have unity. It behoves us now rather than to continue in this unity, not only to speak peace and unity from within, but also for, for those who are in the condition that we were once in. 
so that all can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul himself is an example of that because Paul is not writing to something that he does not know about, that he is not a part of. Paul is just saying, well, he did not bring it out there, but he expects that this is what believers will do. Well, uh, as we look at our lesson this morning, peace, Jews and Gentiles, peace in the church. How can we learn to be preachers of peace as opposed to conduits of conflict? And then is there any situation that exists right now, whether it be in the Caribbean, whether it be in the US, whether it be in the UK, that we can use this method to help bring healing to some situation that exists in the church? We are all pilgrims. I, I, I would use that word. Whether we were whatever situation we had found ourselves in, God has saved us. But we have not arrived. And we are pilgrims. We are passing through. We are saved to serve. It's a situation where Christ did not, re this week we are looking at the horizontal situation. And when we, earlier in the, in the passage, we would have looked at the vertical situation, how Christ bridged the gap between heaven and earth. But now God expects us to reach out to our fellow men. And when you look at the symbol of the cross, it's a wood, one horizontal beam, and then there's a vertical beam. We look at the vertical situation between heaven and earth, and now we are looking at Christ's outstretched arms on the cross, which is the horizontal situation. And that is an all-encompassing situation where there should be unity, whether we are of a different cultural background, whether we are of a different nationality, whether we are of a different religious persuasion. Christ has died, not only that I would have peace in my heart, but so that I can reach out to my fellow men so that they also could experience the Prince of Peace. This world is in a state of turmoil. And we should be exhibits of peace. And Christ is the one who has come to give us that. The world is looking for peace. The United Nations is looking for peace and so on. And all the methods that they have used are failing. Whilst they are saying peace, there is war. All sort of plans and all sort of new weapons are being made, but Christ's method will succeed because it's not a, a, a method of combat. It's a method of peace, love, reaching out. Now the question is, how can we Make a difference. How can we bring healing? Christ has shown us how we can bring healing in our churches, how they can be healing. Sad to say, in our churches, there is still lots of, we need the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that will give us the Spirit of peace. He that has the Spirit cannot really be made miserable. We can, we can do away with the Spirit of complaining and murmuring and backbiting and, and spreading of all manner of falsehoods and so on. That's the only way peace can, and this must be done 
when the heart is consecrated to Christ. Without Christ in the heart, there would be no peace. We can sing all this, uh, we sing the song, Jesus is the joy of living, he's the prince of peace, he's the king of, I mean, when Christ is resident in the heart, then there will be peace. And so, in the time in which we live, the healing will only come from the Spirit. We preach all manner of things. Christ is preaching peace. But that peace, and the Apostle Paul speaks about that in Ephesians chapter 1, where he said that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings. And so, unless there is peace in my heart, I cannot display peace. And we need, the, the church needs to get to the place. And when I speak of the church, I'm speaking about each one of us. We need to get to the place where our talk goes beyond talk. Because that is not, having a mental assent to thing and we can give lip service to a lot, it will not bring peace within our hearts. It will not bring peace within the church. It will not bring peace within our country. It's only when the Prince of Peace is resident in our lives, which means that we need to surrender to the Prince of Peace. That is the only time we will experience peace. And so that is what Paul is saying, is the recipe for healing. So Elder, what would be your takeaway when you look at this lesson this week, Jesus, the preacher of peace today on Wednesday, what is your take on it? What is the point that resonated with you as you studied Wednesday's lesson? When I studied Wednesday's lesson, I reflected on Jesus, how Jesus lived. Jesus, in his preaching, Jesus mingled with everyone, right? And as he mingled, he was able to influence others. When I look at Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Jesus lived peace. The, uh, Jesus had power that he could have met power with power. I mean, we studied earlier in, 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 in the quarter that he has unlimited power and the, the, the sort of power that that the governments had or or the church people thought that they had jesus could have more than met their power but jesus who you know it's like a man coming to you with a knife when you have a ak-47 or something jesus had power, but jesus chose not to use that sort of power but he chose to you he chose to you use love so that he can dispel hatred and evil and so that is my takeaway i need to be like jesus because when jesus as it were display that sort of horizontal love display it was not only for me, but what Jesus was doing there, Jesus was setting the pattern to show one can really be an overcomer. One needs to love. One needs to em embrace everyone. That is what Jesus was doing. And it is telling me that all my prejudices need to be dispelled. It needs to be broken down. Whether you have a different accent, whether you have money, whether you are a, a vagrant on the street or what, all my prejudices should be broken down. And the only way that could be broken down is with the love of Christ, the spirit of Christ in my heart. That's my takeaway from today's study. 
Okay, wonderful studying with you. I want to thank Elder Ellis for sharing with us this morning on the topic, Jesus, the preacher of peace. And I want to close with these few lines. It says, Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight, rolls a melody sweeter than sound. In celestial, like strains, it unceasingly falls over my soul like an infinite calm. And the refrain says, peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. I hope that you will make that your prayer today, that Jesus will roll out the spirit of peace upon you, that wherever you reside, be it in the church, be it at work or just socializing with others the peace of god that reigns in your heart will emanate to others around you god bless you and have a wonderful day